Hello, my name is Eric, and I am a story topper. Have you ever heard of a story topper before? That means you tell me a story or you say something to me, and I am almost guaranteed to have a story that's either related to or probably even better than yours, at least in my own head. How many of you in the room are fellow story toppers? Loud and proud. Here's the problem with being a story topper. It's all about you, and it's never about the other person. In fact, this is where most people get, those of us who are story toppers, because we're so busy trying to figure out either a story that we can share, because we like to tell stories. In fact, in eighth grade, I was voted most likely to tell a story. I know that surprises most of you who know me. But we're so concerned with what it is that we're going to say that we stop listening to the other person. Today, we're going to be talking about taming the tongue. This is not a matter to take lightly because it literally is a matter of life and death or death. Because as, as scriptures will show us, the very first scripture that we're going to look at today is Proverbs 18, 20 to 21. It says this, from the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, notice it doesn't say which type of fruit you will be satisfied with. It just says you will be satisfied with the fruit and the harvest of your lips. So I need you to begin to ask the question, what is the fruit of your lips? And where is that fruit coming from or originating from? from because there's so many of us who say things and we don't think about the words that are coming out of our mouth we say things very flippantly not realizing how it could affect those around us and how honestly it's affecting ourselves i remember when I was working at Pietro's uh, Italian restaurant as a server, um, one of uh, the fellow, my fellow servers and I, this gentleman happened to be of a different racial makeup than I, and we, we became very, very comfortable with each other. And at times, we would actually use racial epitaphs towards each other. And it was just a total joking matter because we knew each other and we were just, they would, they would just come out and we wouldn't even necessarily think about it because we were comfortable with each other. Like, who cares what other people think? Well, one night we were in a, it was a Friday night and it was a crazy busy night in the restaurant. We we're, were just flying all around and next thing you know, he and I are, you know, we're just kind of getting on each other's cases and these racial epitaphs are just coming out to each other. Well... It was about halfway through the night, and our manager walks up, and he says, what did you do to the lady at table 35? <laughs> like, nothing? It's not even in my section. <laughs> well, I don't know what you do, but this woman is threatening to leave the restaurant because she's terribly offended. You need to go fix it. Find out what you did and fix it. I literally have no idea what I'm walking into, right? So I walk up, and I'm like, man, my my name is Eric, and and, uh, um, apparently I've somehow offended you. Uh, Can can you help me out? Because, ma'am, I'm I'm struggling with what I could have said or done that would have offended you. And she says, first, uh, young man, what I need you to do is go get that other server that you've been talking with. And all of a sudden, I was like, I think I know where this is going. So I went over, and I get this guy, and I'm like, 
dude, you just got to come with me for a second because I think we're about to get pummeled. So we walk over, and she says, gentlemen, I need you to let you know. And this woman happened to be of the same racial makeup that this young man was. And she said to us collectively, she says, the words that are using, you don't think that they're really affecting anybody, but I can tell you those words, and she looked directly at me, and it felt like this woman was looking into my soul. And she looked at me and she says, those words that you are using have a completely different context because of the generation that I grew up in. You have no idea what those words even mean, and you don't really have the right to use them the way that you're using them so flippantly. At that moment, I realized that words have the power of life, and in this case, they had the power of death. Now, did I intend to offend her? No. Did I offend her? Yes. Was she justified in the offense? Yes. Now, I've said from this stage before, there's a lot of times that we get way too offended by things, right? My color's blue. I'm offended. My color's, my favorite color's red. Like, in that case, get over yourself. That's just dumb. Okay? But in this case, this woman had the right to be offended. And the fruit of my mouth at that moment in time was evil. And I needed to recognize it. Now, one thing about this is we might be filled by the fruit of our lips. but And it says it satisfies. Here's the thing. It doesn't say how long it satisfies. Right? The person's stomach is filled with the harvest of their lips. They are satisfied. It doesn't say how long they're satisfied. Because those of us who know, who have been entrenched in sin in our life, that it satisfies for a moment, but we need it again. We need the fix again because it doesn't continue to satisfy. But if we're satisfied with the harvest of life, I can guarantee you that's going to satisfy us much longer. Luke 6, 45 says, the good person... Out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Now we're going to get back to this verse in just a little bit. But I want to just kind of break down the, the good treasure or the bad treasure. The good treasure or the evil treasure. The good person or the evil person. Because when you break it down, a good person has things like praise to God. We heard all about that during our time this morning. Encouragement. You encourage the other person. You bring peace when you enter a room. You have a listening spirit. You're others serving. You're focused on other people when you have this good treasure laid up in your heart. Because it's not about you. An evil person has things like gossip, slander, talking bad about other people, malice, which just means every form of evil intent when words come out, argumentative spirit. There's so much argumentative spirit that's out there these days, and it has no place, and it's self-serving, it's self-seeking. So if we are called as believers in Jesus to be the good person, what we have to recognize is where, when does those evil tendencies come into our lives and how can we keep short accounts with God to repent of those things because we've all done those things. I'd like one person in the room to raise their hand who hasn't done one of the things on the evil side. Can we just own that for just a second, please? We've all done it. We've all gossiped, sometimes in the form of prayer requests. You know, I'm going to beat that drum till somebody gets it, because I've said that several times. Oh, we need to pray for so-and-so. But did you hear about what they did? I mean, really? Can you believe that? Come on, people. That's gossip. And it's evil. 
How many of us have slandered somebody else so that we could get a promotion? Can you give me one good reason why it's okay to talk against someone else's character? It is never okay. I may totally disagree with what somebody is doing, their actions, but I have no right to attack their character. Because if, if their character is that corrupted, that it's showing out in the evil things they do, that person needs Jesus. Instead of condemning them, why am I not sharing Jesus with them so they can be freed from their evil ways? But so often we take the moral high ground and we condemn that person. Friends, judgment is the Lord's, not yours. Proverbs 10, 11 says, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals evil. Do you know people or have people in your life who are what you would call high maintenance or life sucking people? Are you one of those people? Or when you come into a room, do you bring peace? Are you a life-sucking or a life-giving type of a person? The words that come out of our mouth have a lot to do with the reflection of what type of person you are. Do you bring a fountain of life when you come in? Or are people always looking at you like, do you have ulterior motives here? Or are you simply serving me because you want to serve me? Or what do you want? What's the catch? I hope that people don't say that about me. But have they? I'm sure they have. Proverbs 26, 20. Without word, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. If you can't say amen, you got to say ouch, as Bodhi Bakum would say. If you can't say amen, you got to say ouch. Proverbs eleven nine: evil words destroy one's friends. Wise discernment rescues the godly. That's what Jim was talking about earlier. Are we asking for wisdom? Are we asking for discernment? Are we asking for those things? Are we taking on like Solomon did when he was given? God said, you can have anything. He's like, I want wisdom. Amen. Are we like that? Or are we asking for prosperity? Are we asking for those things? James 1.26, if anyone considers him religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Now, later on in James, it talks about how the, the, the tongue, um, being a very small member of the body, can actually set it on fire. It actually says, and it is set on fire by hell itself. (sighs) Friends, why are we not taking this more accountability for the words that come out of our mouth? We say them so flippantly, they just come out. Why are we not recognizing? It says this, the, the, these massive ships get steered to and fro by this tiny little rudder in the back. Or, or a forest fire by just one spark and then it's just engulfed acres. Do we recognize how hurtful our words can be? But on the flip side, do we recognize how life-giving our words can be? That, that's amazing. I had the wonderful, I've had the wonderful opportunity to speak at many different camps and, and summer camps and different places, and I've, that's a privilege that I get to do. When I was here at uh, Cheyenne and Brian's wedding, uh, Cheyenne Concitus, Brian Cheesebro, um, I had the opportunity to, to perform that wedding. Afterwards, this young woman comes up to me. She's like, you don't know me, but you spoke at a camp, and I need to tell you that God used the words that you had and totally changed my life. Now, I didn't change her life. God changed her life. But I got to be the messenger of that. God got to use the words and craft them in such a way 
that this woman was totally changed. What a blessing that is. But if we don't keep a tight rein on our tongue, if we're not self-serving, we need to keep that in mind. Proverbs 17, 27 through 28. A man of knowledge uses words with restraint, and a man of understanding is even-tempered. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. Shut your mouth. Now, for those of us who use words as a living, that's difficult sometimes. Because, you know, God will give something brilliant that I feel needs to be said. Am I listening to God enough for him to say, nope, that's not for right now? Or don't say anything. Because oftentimes it's in the silent. Because when you are silent, you can actually listen to what this person actually is saying. Sometimes we just need to keep silent. Confession. When we're thinking about keeping short accounts with God and recognizing this sin that's in us, confession is important. We need to speak it with our mouth. This is one of the places where we can breathe life in our own life because we're saying to God, I sinned. This was not okay. This week, God, this is what I did that went against your will. I'm speaking it out loud. I'm owning it because I want to fully bring it to your throne. When we've sinned against other people, when we've had misunderstandings with other people, just to be able to talk and say something, to hear the other person say, yes, our relationship is restored. Tim and I had something like that just a couple weeks ago, right? There was a situation that came up between he and I. There was a few days that went by, and finally we got a chance to talk with each other, and we just got to say, brother, I love you, I think highly of you, let's move on. I'm grateful for that. But it was the confession of our lips that restored the relationship. Because in that space, how many false narratives do we often create? The silence comes in and we're like, are they mad at me? Who else did they tell? Who else thinks I'm nobody? Who else thinks I'm this? Who else thinks I'm that? And we create this false narrative, and when we speak those words to ourselves enough, then we think, oh, it must be true. There was no truth in any false narrative that was between Tim and I. We've known each other for a long time. I knew I just needed to get a hold of my friend. Set the record right. Let's go. Awesome. I loved it. But how many times have we not let relationships be restored because of the way we're speaking to ourselves? We'll get to that in just a second. But this last part, when we confess the name of Jesus, we talked about that all this morning during the songs. When we confess the name of Jesus, that exalted place that God had placed Jesus above all others, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. When we do that, when we speak the word, when we speak Jesus' name, it puts the enemy in his proper place. Oh, come on, people. (laughs) Help me out here. It puts the enemy in his proper place. That should get us excited. Because where is Jesus? He's under the foot. Where is the Satan? He's under the foot of Jesus. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Are we putting Jesus in the proper place in our heart so that the enemy has no room to prosper? Because he wants to prosper. He wants you to be that evil person. But we know that when we've confessed the name of Jesus, that we are his righteousness. Amen? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But we need to confess our sins. Satan can't read your mind. Did you know that? 
He can't. That's the importance of speaking the confession. Speaking the sin and saying, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Get thee behind me. You're putting the sin in its proper place so that the grace of God can take its proper throne in your life. Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is the word of the Lord, friends. This is what we need to have on our lips when sin enters our life. Keep short accounts with God so we can put the enemy in his proper place. Romans 10.10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It's the, the confession that Jesus is Lord. Do we often, though, use words to fit in in different places? I know I look at myself, and that has happened way too many times in my life where I've used words and not good words or nice words to fit in to different places. Our identity is definitely reflected by the speech that comes out of our lips. Again, are we seeking the praise of men? In Proverbs it says that a man will be, will be uh, tested by the praise he receives. Oftentimes we have a hard time receiving things. But how are we? Are we seeking that praise of men? Are we saying things so other people will say, oh, wow, that's really good, or whatever? And I don't know that I even really want to go down this road necessarily, but I'm feeling the Lord saying, it's also in what, not only in what we say, but in what we write. Because, friends, there's a lot of y'all on Facebook that need to shut your mouth. I love you, the Lord loves you, but there's a lot of quarrels that are being put up because people, they think that they're standing for something. And I'm not saying don't don't put stuff out there that is really important. That's not what I'm saying. But when you begin to tear other people down with your words, it's not just a cause that you're saying, this is really important, people, you need to be about it. I'm all about information. I'm all about education in the proper form. But when you begin to tear people down with your words, that is just plain evil. And you need to stop. It's the argumentative spirit that's coming up in you. That's causing you to do this. Please stop. Try, stop trying to seek men. Stop trying to get more followers. Stop trying to do this. Because our identity is reflected in how we speak and how we write and how we put ourselves out there. Are we tearing others down to make ourselves look better? Most of the time, when people go after somebody else, it's because they don't necessarily feel very good about themselves. They want to make the other person look bad so they themselves automatically will look a little bit better. Again, we need to recognize this in our lives because when it comes down to it, we have to remember the heart connection to the speech that comes out of our mouth. Let's go back to the Luke 6, 4, 45 passage. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. As I, I've read this verse so many times in my life, but for the first time, the word abundance jumped off the page. In order to have an abundance, you must be filled first. What are you filled with? Because if the abundance is coming out is evil, then you're filled with evil. If the abundance that's coming out is good, then you're filled with good. But you have to own where you are. Because those are the two options. So what fills your heart? 
When we are in Christ, what fills us is him. And the words we speak are him because the abundance must be him as well. If the word is in us and we're speaking the word, which is Jesus, and we're pointing people to Jesus, then the abundance which is in us, which fills us, is Jesus. And what people get is Jesus. Does that make sense? Jason talked a couple weeks ago about being ready, and he warned us that we need to be in a place where we can be effective. If we're in the evil camp and we're spewing evil, then we are not being effective for the kingdom because that's what the enemy wants. Put him in his proper place. Ask Jesus to come into your heart so you can be filled with him because then you'll be ready when you have the opportunity to speak of him. Jesus is the word, so we must fill our heart with him. Colossians 2, 9 through 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. We are brought to fullness in him. When he is the fullness of our hearts. And the abundance then is Jesus Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That word is there. The word is Jesus. Therefore, that's what's hidden. That's the treasure that's hidden in the field. The field is our heart. When we are actually have that hidden, we can then bring it out when we need to because that's going to that's gonna put the devil in their proper place. It's going to keep us from sinning. Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my heart. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Time and time again, the Lord warns us about our lips. But just as much as he warns us about what's coming out of our lips, he also warns about what's coming into our heart. How many of you have had people speak harshly to you this week? How are you receiving those words. Are you letting them just be like a duck and just roll off your back because they mean nothing to you because they're coming from an evil person or from an evil source? Because so often we give so much credit to the words that are coming at us, which is just as important as the words that are coming from our lips. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Here's what the Old Testament says about what we're supposed to do in terms of the word and the law. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Praise be the name of the Lord. Is there any part of there that of your life that you're not supposed to talk about, the, the one who gave you life? I don't see any part. It encompasses all of life, right? My family for the last six weeks have been going through a bit of a trial. Some of you know about it. I'm so grateful for my wife. She's actually taken scripture verses and she's put them at different points in our home so that when you're washing the dishes, there's the word of God. When you walk into the bathroom, there's the word of God. You see it and are reminded of it. And you're reminded of his goodness and his grace because that's what you need to fill your heart, your mind, and your life with. Not the other garbage that's out there. First Peter 4, 10 through 11. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, just pause there for a second. If anyone speaks, this is not speaking to those who speak for a living. Oftentimes, some people will say, well, if anyone is a speaker, that's not what it says. 
If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If God's word is hidden in your heart, that's all you have to speak, is pointing people to Jesus. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any... Just going to let that sit in for a second. It's a small word, but it has a powerful meaning. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. How many of you had unwholesome talk come out of your mouth this week? Probably most of us should raise our hands, right? Well, if it's not wholesome, then why are we saying it? Friends, these are really simple questions. But they have difficult answers because it makes us recognize, well, what's the condition of my heart that that unwholesome talk is coming out? What is helpful for, so here, so, so let me read the whole thing again. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. You always have an audience. I don't care who you are, where you are, you always have an audience. Are you speaking to build the other person up, or are you speaking to tear them down? Are you speaking to be self-serving, or are you actually doing it so that person may be built up according to their needs? And the only way that you can know what their needs are is to shut your mouth and listen. But we're too busy talking. We're too busy story topping. I'm talking to this guy. I'm just bringing you into the conversation that I've had with God this whole week. When when will we recognize that it's not about us, but it's about God working through us for other people? That's where God can work mightily. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, this is the job description of the word of God. If we have the word of God in us, this is our job description too. Because people think, they they take the word rebuking as a negative thing. Oh no, it is not. Sometimes we need to rebuke a brother in the Lord. I've had people, Jim Clark has rebuked me. I've been gracious for it. He's like, yeah, that stuff that you were doing, brother, you got to rethink that. And I had to rethink it and then come to you and say, ooh, that stuff, no, that was not okay. I'd rather have a rebuke from a brother that the Lord has put in than for God to rain his anger down on me because I'm being blasphemous. This is our job description. When we have the word of God in us, this is what we are to use our speech for. If it falls outside of this, we should not say it. We have to think about how we're saying things and what we're saying. So when we're speaking the word, if we're recognizing how do we tame our tongue, we come back to the good treasures that we had at the beginning of our time together. The good treasures are, are we praising him above all else? Are we encouraging our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord with what God is doing in our life? Are we pointing them to Jesus? I'm not the encourager. I point them to Jesus who brings peace. I'm not the peacemaker. Jesus is the peacemaker. But when I have him in my heart, when my identity is in him, when your identity is in Jesus, the word will be in abundance, and from that abundance is where the mouth will then speak. And do we have wisdom and discernment to know when to stop talking and listen? Because in the silence is where wisdom can really be understood. And then are we looking to serve 
others rather than serving ourselves. Friends, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But in order to have an abundance, it needs to be filled. What is your heart filled with this morning? My hope is that it's filled with Jesus and his love for you. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in your mighty and powerful name. We're grateful for Jesus. We're grateful for the word. We're grateful that it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, help it to discern our thoughts. Father, create right spirits in us today so that we may be in your presence. Search us today, Lord, and know our hearts. See if there's any anxious or disrespectful thoughts, Lord. Cleanse us from that unrighteousness so that we may be fully engulfed in your peace and your love so that, Lord, we can then share that love in abundance with those around us. Father, we're so grateful for your love today. Jesus, we're so grateful for the authority and the power of your name today. Let us speak your name often. And when we speak, Lord, may it be your word and your word only. In Jesus' name we pray all these things.